Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is some of you and peace out to the rest of you. This is Black Heart Sign of Black In again. Um, I'm going to skip the part about which buttons to press and why. You know what the drill is. The message is more important than the messenger. So what I'm saying is more important even than myself. Um, I want to thank the subscribers again for chiming in on this. Um, I want to thank Abdullah bin Bobby and YW by name. Uh, now that doesn't mean I'm overlooking the hurtful things they're saying to each other. It's not that, but on one hand, they're putting the issues on the table. They're putting the cards on the table. Now I would do it in a more civil tone and that's what we need, but they are putting issues on the table. And the truth be told, Saeed Raghia and Shadid Muhammad are putting the issues on the table, although I would have done it in a more civil tone. And one of the things I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to suggest here in this recording is that whenever a community begins to discuss its own issue internally, the other community uh, that is discussing a reconciliation with the first one has the right to admit that such an issue exists in the other community, but not to sit up and needle and goad them because of it once they have taken this issue on themselves. What I mean is for, as an example, let's take the issue of fornication. Let's deal with that in all of its forms. One night stands, prostitution, <laughs> tricking, uh, travel tricking, whichever the case is. Let's deal with this. African Americans are dealing with the issue of the gender divide between us. Now, this does not mean that other nationalities need to turn around and start uh, using that to needle and goad us. But they do have the right to say, OK, well, the issue does exist before we invest in something that this issue could turn around and ruin the return on from the investment. We will wait for your community to finish hashing it out. They have the right to say that you've dealt with it. You're confronting it. It's an issue. We know it's we know it exists. We're not going to needle and goad you with the issue. We're just not going to make an investment that could be ruined by that particular issue. And the reverse is true. Young people in the Somali community are coming uh, and, and telling the elders, which is a brave thing to do in there their community. You don't tell elders nothing. It's just like with us. Old niggas, you can't tell nothing. It's more so with them. You know how in our community you can't tell old nigga nothing. And old nigga knows everything even though uh, <laughs> even though he refused to learn to a certain extent. It is perfectly okay. We have come along and said, okay, you know what? You old niggas screwed some things up. We may not hate you, but we ain't got to take everything you say at face value. You ain't uh, automatically wise because you old. There's such a thing as an old fool and you have this amongst your ranks, you elders. Well, guess what? That's why we got these old niggas talking about, uh, man, I, yeah, I pay everything. I do all this. I do all that for my woman because I'm a real man and they don't want to accept the fact that things have changed and that even their own daughters are different than their wives are. They don't want to accept that. Okay. We're dealing with that. They have a right to say to us, okay, look, Eidos, y'all are dealing with this. Now, if we're going to make an investment, we have a right to withhold what we're, we're making an investment into something that could possibly be affected by that issue before you have it resolved. That's a polite way of saying we know it's an issue. We're not going to needle and goad you. We'll help you if you ask. Right now, we'll leave it as one of your internal issues. You'll deal with it. And then when you deal with it, we can make investments that otherwise would have been harmed by that issue. This is a very civil way for two communities to discuss a very necessary reconciliation without needling and goading each other about it. Does fornication exist in both of our communities? Absolutely. How much so? I don't know. Stats, we have, there are more stats on African Americans than there are on uh, really any other nationality of black people. Um, however... Uh, the thing is that we really don't know. Now, Shadid Muhammad did apologize for his statement about high rates of prostitution among Somali women in Atlanta. He apologized for that. He said that was wrong. I believe it, but I don't have the proof to back it up, so I shouldn't say it. I don't know why he believes it. Because the situation uh, that really made even a lot of Somalis think that there were high rates of prostitution and among the Somali community in the Atlanta area turned out to be a false uh, case. 
So I don't know why he believes it, but he took a very fair stance in that regard, saying, I'm not going to say it if I don't have the proof to back it up. Saeed Rakia did not say anything that he said with proof to back it up. He could have gone to black demographics and he could have cleared up even his own misconceptions about something, but he didn't do it. He didn't cite it. He probably doesn't even know about the website. He made the statement at a masjid in Kenya to a largely Somali audience. But then again, Shadid Muhammad did something wrong. He said, you saw the people laughing in the audience. No, Shadid, no, bro, no, no, no. It's one of those that's, that's been on uh, one of those that's, that's listened to you and learned from you and benefited from you, I have to say that no, I did not see people laughing and kikiing and haw hawing when the camera panned to the audience. I saw them looking at each other. And the reason why they looked at each other, Mr. Muhammad, is because they knew that this was a sensitive issue and it probably should not have been mentioned in this way. And the Somali community uh, issued an apology to the African American community. And I'm talking about their unified councils of elders in different places issued an apology. He said something and it hurts you. And we're sorry about that because we don't have an issue with you. We don't hate you. They may have issues with us, but they don't hate us. The tone of what they were saying is this was disrespectful. And we're sorry about that because we don't approve of disrespecting you like that. It's okay that we have issues with each other. If these issues can be treated like issues between two relatives, then that is actually very normal. We deal with it the way relatives would deal with an issue. We deal with it the way teammates would deal with an issue. It's okay to have disagreements. We're not going to agree on everything. And one of the best things that we have in order to hash out the disagreements is going to be first the Quran and then the Sunnah of Muhammad ibn Abdullah, peace be to him. That's going to be the framework. You step outside of that, okay, well, you got a different religion altogether anyway. So we could ethnically cooperate with you, but not necessarily religiously. If you're within that, then you, we can say that, okay, ethnically and religiously, we can cooperate. But we aren't wrong because we discuss certain issues. We're wrong because we don't have a framework to do so in the way that uh, relatives or teammates would discuss an issue that they want to hash out so that it does not divide rather than hashing them out in a way that divides. We're ha trying to hash them out in a way that divides. And Shadid even said, look, you, you say some, I'm going to go hard in defense of African-American women. I'm not. But you know what? He's, uh, it, he, there, sometimes people like him are needed because if you're going to go after any group of people for something that they did not do, but everybody thinks they did it, he's the guy you want on your side. That's what's going on. So from that regard, yeah, we're going to need someone like uh, we're going to need someone with his pension for defending us because we're going to be blamed for things that we didn't do. But this is true for all black communities, including uh, the Somali community. They're going to be blamed for things they didn't do. And they're going to be blamed for things that may have been an issue a generation ago and are no longer an issue in today's time. What is the reason for that? Again, we lost sight of the common enemy. Both of us lost sight of this common enemy, and that common enemy is white supremacy. And at this point, I've decided that if I had to choose between Saeed Ragia and Shadid Muhammad, the reason I would side with Shadid would not be because he's African-American. It would be because he attacked the issue of white supremacy that I know I saw him do it, and I don't know that Saeed Ragia attacked the issue of white supremacy. If I find out that he attacked it the same way or as vehemently, as relevantly, then I would sell Camel's side with both because, like I said, the two of them can sit down and have dinner and hash out their disagreements. They don't hate each other, and they're not trying to be disrespectful even though they disagree and it's public. But the rest of us, lay people who aren't scholars, are getting caught up in all of this, and I'm seeing it even on my page as I put, this, these, as I put up these videos and I see the comments underneath where you Somalis and you African Americans and you Africans and you non-American blacks. And, and we say this as if to say all the most. When you say all the most, you know what? We have the right to say all the most if we can have a, if there's a stat to back it up or if there's a confession from the people within that community themselves. If there's not that, if, there's, if it's going to be a point of contest and you can't bring a stat to back it up, then fuck the shuck up about that particular issue. And not only that, but this is something both of us need to do when it comes to each other. We need to understand that there is an age gap as well, a generation gap. It's both good and it's bad. But one of the good things about the age gap is that in both of our communities, the youngsters are telling the elders, we're not going to hold on to blind traditions 
uh, and accept peer pressure from dead people to do something that doesn't work. It's not working. It got tested and it failed. We each are doing this in, in each of our communities, but we're doing it separately and it makes sense. It's different language, it's different cultures. But since we are related and since many of us are becoming Muslim, then the fact remains that we're going to have to start, uh, well, again, we're going to have to cooperate as the same family and the same team. Two relatives that happen to also be playing on the same team, that team being a religion, and also that team being uh, just a concern for justice and righteousness. We're going to have to play um, as though we're that. Now, you see the strategy as being good against the, as winning against the opposition. The other one sees that strategy as being good for winning against the opposition. Okay, you're going to hash this out like relatives and teammates would do. But right now what's happening is that even though Shadid Muhammad and Saeed are not going to go at each other's throats, the issue still remains that unfortunately many of us lay people on the team who are on scholars are now beginning to forget that we're related. And in many cases, even on the same team. We're beginning to forget this. Now we're still bickering. You Somalis, this, that, and the other. You African Americans, this, that, and the other. Now, on one hand, I want to say this. Um, one commentator said, well, a lot of Africans don't want to marry you African-Americans because you hold to your African-American culture, which, which is incompatible with ours. Excuse me, one second. Which African-American culture are you talking about and which African culture are you talking about? We're related. We're not identical. The cultures are going to be different. In the north and the south of Somalia, there are going to be cultural differences. There are people that can't marry each other based on tribes, although that is disappearing. And that's being done away with, thanks to your younger generation. And I got to tip my hat to you for it. You're pushing it back against the tribalism. That's good. It also means that it exists. And so we have the right to accept that you have problems with tribalism because your people have confessed it. But we also should not say, OK, well, look, we're going to use your tribalism against you. And we're going to use that to needle and gold you. We do have the right to say we're not going to fall into that same problem. You fell into it. We ain't going to do that. We're going to try to avoid that problem. No disrespect to you because y'all trying to work it out. And as a matter of fact, if you know anything that can help you help us avoid that issue, we're going to shut the F up and take your advice and listen while you tell us how it could have been avoided. And when we find out how to get around the problem and, and what to do when it's behind us, that's going to be your turn to fuck the shuck up and let us tell you, OK, this is how you deal with the next thing after you get around this particular problem, because we've been down this road before. See, these are civil ways that you hash out differences when you are on the same team as someone or when you are related. True disunity comes when you forget that you are playing against another team and that team is playing to win. They ain't even playing fair. And it's an uphill battle. For you, not for them. Uphill for you, downhill for them. That's, that is when you start to understand you forget that that's when they began to understand that they got a higher chance at winning and they become more aggressive because you ain't united look in Canada whenever there is negrophobic violence they go after the Somalis did you know that so they dealt with with, with uh, not only bias against them but violent bias against them we don't have to act like they don't know what it's like. No, they know what it's like. They've been discriminated against. Somebody brought up that Somalia tore itself apart in the Civil War. Well, the generation with which we're dealing is not the generation that started the Civil War. So we can't really blame it on the ones that we've met. They left. We could say, well, you know, now they turn around and beg white zaddy for refuge in a place. Well, they were forced to do it. They were, a lot of them were young, youngsters at the time. And they were, here's the other thing I want people to understand about African-Americans and about Somalis. That is that both of us are going through trauma and we have not dealt with it because both of us come from cultures that are very similar. And one of the similarities in these cultures is a bad thing. And that is telling us, well, you're Muslim and you're black and you're African, so you've got the magic pill and you should not be depressed. We had to leave our country because of a damn civil war with other Muslims who were black that shouldn't have been depressed. And now you're telling me I can't play with this kid over here because this kid's parents or this kid's uncles were on the opposite side of the war back home. 
But we in a country where don't nobody know nothing about any of that. And in a few years, when we reach 15% of the population, that's when their white, uh, uh, white fears of annihilation are going to kick in and they're going to start kicking all our asses. They're not going to ask, are you Darud or are you Ishaq? They ain't going to ask that question, are you Mithgan? They ain't going to say that. They're going to say, look, you wide nose, big lip nigga, even if you, even if you don't have those features, they're going to say this. Get your charcoal ass, get out of my country. That's what they're going to say. They're not going to check the fineness of your hair and the width of your nose and the thickness of your lips. They're not going to do any forehead measurements when they get to that point. They only do that when you become a bigger percentage of the population and then they can use that to divide you from yourselves. That's the only time they do it. So when we are dealing with these issues, we're going to have to understand and the same thing for African Americans. We don't have the right to sit up here and, and uh, we don't have the right to act like Somalis don't know what it is to go through racial bias. And they don't have that right to act like we don't know what it's like to deal with trauma. We both dealt with trauma. The trauma comes from, and it's actually very similar for both of us. We were in a sense forced out of our own homelands, one by the push method, the other one by the pull method. We were both forced out of our own homelands. And, these were, and, and the forcing was related to issues uh, that would uh, pit one against the other back home in different ways. In other words, in Somalia, the fighting broke out, pushed a lot of people out. In Western Africa, people were being grabbed up and wars were being stoked in order to increase the number of captives that would be taken and brought to the coastline. So they were related in different orders to each other, but the combination is still the same, even though the recipe slightly varies in terms of what you add to the mix, what order, and at what temperature you cook it. You're pretty much cooking the same thing. We both got served a nasty dish of stinky, smelly, parasite-infested pork. It's just that the recipes were different to undercook it in both cases. And we, we were traumatized by this, and the trauma is being passed on from generation to generation in both communities. And as this trauma gets passed on from generation to generation in both communities, you have the youngsters who are now beginning to say, we're going to question all this stuff that you hold as some sort of sacred tradition. This is what we got a lot in common. And this is that's a good thing. But one of the bad things is that we both have this trauma and we have our elders who are telling us not to deal with it in a particular way that would help. And we're going to need some therapy. And frankly, I don't trust anybody else to help provide the therapy. So one of the things we're going to need are some counseling therapists from both communities. And while we sit up here bickering and arguing, I'm going to drop a bombshell on y'all about something. If you black and you need some therapy and you have to choose between a Somali counselor or uh, some Ofe counselor or some counselor that ain't black and don't care nothing about black people, you'd rather take, you better take your bet with the one from Somalia. And if you're Somali and you need some counseling and you have a choice between an African-American counselor, especially if he's Muslim or she's Muslim, and some other counselors that don't know nothing about black folk and don't really care nothing about black, black folk, even if they are Muslim, you better take your bet with the African-American. Because as we talk and deal with this, one of the things that we're both going to start finding out is how much we got in common, like I've been saying. And I think this is necessary. I really do. The, the, the counseling is going to be necessary because there is trauma and the trauma has affected all of us. And every trauma that one of us has been through, I can draw a correlation to a similar trauma that the other one has been through. And, I'm gonna and if I want to give examples, if you want examples, I could do it, but it's going to have, I'm going to have to talk about sensitive issues for both communities. But since I'm doing it for both, I'm going to go ahead and do it with no shame. We got molestation in our communities of kids. Sometimes by babysitters, sometimes by complete strangers, but usually by someone in a trusted position, i.e. a babysitter or relative, both of the communities. The genitals of children in both communities are being mutilated. Whether it's by circumcision or molestation, in either case, the genitals are being harmed. They're not being cleaned, they're being harmed. That's what's going on in both of our communities. Now, which one has it more? We don't know. These are crimes. People don't confess this every time. So it's hard to really get stats and it's hard to prove stats that you can get. 
but we do have this. Now, how do I know we have this? And this is how you know I'm not saying it's to stoke a needle or go in either community. The way I we the way I know we have this is because the young people of both communities are calling on the elders to deal with this and stop trying to sweep it under the rug. This is the commonality. So there's more uh, uh, to discuss in common than there is to fight over as a difference. Yeah, our cultures are different, but the traumas are the same. And if you think that I'm talking idealistically and uh, uh, f from a standpoint of a fantasy world, when I say we're on the same team, let me remind you who the other team is, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. We got these same traumas. Where do these traumas come from? Number one, our own traditions that don't help. Number two, massa. White supremacy, that thing that a lot of new neo-black conservatives want to say does not exist is exactly that common enemy. Some of you want to say, well, we never dealt with racism in our country. Yes, you did. Why do you think the British uh, colonized one half and the Italians colonized the other half of your country? Because of white supremacy. Some of you want to say, oh, I didn't really even know I was black till I left my home and came over here. <laughs> well, if you didn't know you were black, that's because you were around number black people, but they were victims of colonization because they were black. Actually, they were victims of colonization because white folks can always be white. I'm talking about the Western Europeans. And some of us black folks like to say, well, you know, we, we don't really know uh, the experience of tearing our own country up. Uh, yeah, actually, we do know the experience of tearing, tearing our own country up. So we haven't really had a nation, but we do have the experience of tearing up our own communities or having to live with others, the worst of us who were a minority, tear up the community and affect the lives of everybody else. So a minority gave us an experience, but we all had it. What the hell you think Crips and Bloods were? Crips, community resistance and progress in the beginning. Bloods, we all won blood, we won family. They were trying to do something about police brutality. What did we wind up with? Street gangs. And then they led, to, they led to offshoots that became other gangs, vice lords, gangster disciples, black guerrilla family. And they became drug gangs and street gangs, beefing with each other. So we did deal with this. We both dealt with internecine conflicts that, have, that, that were participated in by a minority among us, but affected the majority, affected everybody. I didn't even grow up in a community like that, and I got affected by it. You got, I mean, eventually that civil war in Somalia started as a skirmish, like all of them do, a little skirmish, and you had a lot, a lot of well-off, highly educated Somalis that had to leave their home countries. In our communities, these little skirmishes wound up blowing up into something much bigger. And then many of us who, after desegregation, wanted to stay in our communities could no longer stay if they could afford to go. The same thing happened. We actually have very common, uh, common histories, if we really won't look at it. But we're going to have to remember that while we do have disagreements, number one, the two that are at the center of this disagreement, they can handle this thing civilly. All we got to do is follow suit with that's concern. They ain't going to always agree. They're going to disagree. But they don't hate each other, and they can hash this stuff out over time. That's the first thing for us to remember. We can simply follow suit without pointing fingers and saying all of you and all of you and all of you. The second thing for us to remember is that we are, we are related cousins on the same team that are having a disagreement, and we cannot afford to forget who that, that opposing team is, because <laughs> them crackers play to win. And when I say win, they play to be the only ones left. There ain't no gangsters like them. They took, they are the reason Behind Tupac's quote, I want to be the last mother breathing. That's what they want to be. Tupac articulated it. They started that stuff. And that's who the opposite team is. I hope you don't forget that. Now, it took me 25 minutes almost to say all of this. And I'm sorry about that. Actually, I'd say about 26, and 20, 26 minutes and 20 seconds by the time you add in that nice little beat that I put in the beginning. It's one of my favorites. All percussion, no drums, nothing haram about it. But the point I'm making is that hopefully one day what I've said will no longer be true. And until that point, hopefully what I've said will benefit us to get to the day that this will no longer be true. Thanks for being patient with me, though. And I mean that.
Black Horse Sign of Blackout. Assalamu alaikum.